I figured, shit, if I'm going to do something new with the pod last night, let's do something new tonight on YouTube. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a video that's, hold your breath, wait for it, wait for it. It's not time sensitive. You can fucking watch this shit in six months. It's still going to be relevant. So what I'm doing today is I'm going to answer some FAQ, some frequently asked questions that people have, and I'm going to break it down and answer it for them. And uh, hopefully this uh, uh, lands well. Maybe a hundred people will watch this. Maybe a thousand of people watch. I don't give a shit. As long as it helps a few people, um, so be it. For all of you that don't know, which I hope is a fuck ton of you, maybe you just randomly, YouTube just throwing this in your recommended, and uh, you're like, who the hell is this guy? Well, let me tell you, I'm the Degenerate 75. I'm a high limit PGA DFS player who runs a pretty badass show. You probably see it right here over my shoulder called the Showdown Hoedown, in which we break down the showdown slates for uh, DFS golf on DraftKings. But we also do a week-long stream every Wednesday, so you better check that out, because if you're doing DraftKings lineups and you don't watch that show before you make it Wednesday night, you're a fucking loser. Just like Rory McIlroy, a fucking loser. So I would be there for that. I would check it out. And so what is going on tonight is I have a Patreon. You can see it right there above me. This isn't a sell. All I want you to do, if you fucking like this video, go give it a like. If you really, really like it, subscribe. And if you're like, man, this guy is the truth, well, then, yeah, you can go check out my Patreon. But this video is really for them because I'm always producing content for them outside of what I do for YouTube. And I ask them, what are some frequently, uh, what are some questions you have that you want some more uh, in-depth analysis on? And they gave them to me. And I figured instead of just making this video for them, I'll just put it out there for all of YouTube. Because if those smart mother fathers in my Discord want to know this stuff, I bet there's some people out there on the YouTubes that want to know this shit, too. Um, uh, do I know everything about PGA DFS? Well, okay. Yeah, I probably do. I know a lot of fucking about this shit. I've been doing it basically as a living. I'm in to my fifth year right now. I have won a lot. I've lost a lot. I have learned from the school of hard knocks. I spent two and a half years being a, a bum that just paid the rake. Like so many people that do this. And then I finally kind of learned how to do it. And I've just kept perfecting my craft and perfecting my craft. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a sustainable winner now. Uh, but don't get that twisted. This shit's hard. There's not a lot of people that win at this consistently year over year. Uh, basically, the only thing I'll promise you is I will help you not make all of the same slap dick mistakes that all the rate payers uh, do and all of the chalk donkeys do. If you don't know what those terms are, stay around because you're going to hear them a bunch. So uh, anyways, this uh, this video is answering their questions. I'm just going to ask the question, probably post edit. We'll go toss them down at the bottom so you can see the questions. And then I'm going to fucking answer them. Pretty simple, right? I have no idea. This might take 15 minutes. It might take an hour. I don't know. Buckle the fuck up. Hang out for a little bit. Maybe take some notes if you're a real champion. And let's fucking learn some shit. Let's do it. Let's do it. Because, you know, it's the 3M. And everybody's like, I don't want to play this week because I'm a huge bitch. You suck it up. Okay, these are these are great weeks to play. If you love fantasy golf, you love it year round. You don't just love it for the majors. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. All right, I'm getting to the questions. I gotta go flip off OBS over here. Not like flip it off with my middle finger. Flip off the screen. Grow the fuck up. Okay, here we go. Uh, got questions. Forgive me. I have to look over at my other screen to ask the questions. Then I'll come back to make an eye contact with you, and you can look at these, uh, you know, pretty ugly brown eyes. So here we go. We got uh, first from Thomas Hogan. Thank you for being a, 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 a supporter of the Discord. Two-tiered two, two question here. First off, contest selection. I typically play single entries, but I want to get better at making player pools and building multiple lineups. Since I also have a relatively small DFS budget, do you think that the $1 or $3.20 max is a good place to practice? Secondly, if that answer is yes, what is a typical number of players that you use for 20 lineups? I'm thinking 15 to 20. And if the pool usually has fewer higher price guys and fewer lower price guys or the other way around, I would like to know the process and strategy. Sorry for being long-winded. Yeah, no shit, Thomas. I'm out of breath just reading your question. But I got you, brother. I got you. So let's uh, let's 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 talk about it. First of all, let's just go over here to the DraftKings and uh, let's go look. Uh, first of all, you got to define what you want to be MME, mass multi-entry. What do you want that to be? For a lot of people, they see the big guys putting 150 lineups in this $20 or in the $5, but that adds up really quick, right? You start to play thousands of dollars in lineups very quickly. So I, I think when a lot of people think MME, they're thinking 150 lineups because that's the most that any one player can put in a single gpp a guaranteed prize pool forgive me i know a lot of you are advanced but some people aren't so i'm gonna fucking spell some of this shit out deal with it 
Um, so if you really want to experiment with that, you can't go wrong with like the 50 cent mini max and stuff like that, right? It's just 50 cents to enter. You can do 150 lineups. So what's that going to cost you? 75 bucks, right? Uh, that's basically the same price you're going to be paying if you were to do the 20 max and the $3, uh, and the, the, the 20, uh, the 20 max and the $1 that's 80 bucks versus 75, essentially the same thing, right? So there's always that to experiment with, but your question seems specifically targeted at uh, a 20 max. And I've always enjoyed 20 maxes. I think they're kind of that Goldilocks zone of like, uh, yes, I get to expand my player pool. I get to mix and match some good players. I can make some good pivots off of chalk. So I enjoy that, but also not where you can just like get a little taste of everybody by doing 150 lineups. So I've always liked begged DraftKings to do like a hundred dollar 20 max, right? Where I can do 20 hundred dollar lineups. Cause that's more like the range I would be interested in playing, but they just don't ever do it. It seems like the only 20 maxes they ever do are the $3, the $1. Sometimes at a major, they do a $4. Ooh. So to answer your question, yes, a 20 max is an amazing place to start. Why are 20 maxes great? Well, I already kind of assinuated some of it. You get to practice <clears throat> Uh, you get to practice uh, building a player pool that is the proper size for how many lineups you're doing. And let's just start right there. When I'm building 20 lineups, you have to remember I go very aggressive. I, in a 20 person, uh, in, in a 20 lineups, I keep my player pool between 13 to 15 players, which is pretty tight. You said 15 to 20. That's a little on the high end. Um, you know, I want to see all of my guys. If I'm doing 20 lineups, I want every one of those guys in my pool to be in at least three of those lineups. So 15% of my lineups. And then yes, that includes even the slap dick $6,200 guy you're playing. Cause you got a feeling about him, right? I want him in three lineups. Why do I want him in three lineups? Because if that mother father does spike at 1%, uh, I don't want him to just be in one of my lineups and then basically the other five guys on that lineup have to be perfect. I want him in a handful of lineups so I have multiple chances that that one guy that I nailed that nobody else was on, if he goes off, I have multiple chances to, to hit something big. That's why I always say at least three of your 20, every player should be in. So let's say you're doing 15 players. You make sure that all 15 of those players are in at least three lineups. Now, naturally, what's going to happen is the guys you like the most are probably, when you play that tight of a player pool, are probably going to end up more like in 50 to 60% of your lineups. So you got to be really convicted about the guys you're going after uh, and really commit to them. And that's that's what a tight player pool will do. And what happens with a tight player pool is sometimes by Friday afternoon, your shit's cooked. Okay, because the six of those 15 guys missed the cut, you ain't got nothing going on. The week, the week, the week long's over for you. You come tune into the showdown hoedown then, right? But you get 14 of 15 across the finish line and you got three or four of them up in the top 10. Now you have so many bullets heading into the weekend with a real chance to win it, especially if you catch a week with some chaos. Maybe there was some weather, maybe all the chalk keeps putting it in the water, whatever it may be. So in recap, I would go 13 to 15 players. I would try that 20 max. The $3 and the $1 are both very good. I would practice getting a good core. Uh, and then th I'm going to answer that. Uh, I'm going to kind of answer this now. And then I got another question that's very similar. I would practice picking my players from different sections of the salaries. Okay. Whenever you make a player pool, you're naturally going to be inclined to be like, Ooh, I want, uh, this is the week of the three M I want Tony Finau and I want Sung JM and I want Hideki Matsuyama. Well, I mean like you can't have all those guys, right? There's this thing called math that doesn't allow you to cram all those guys in your lineup. So you need to be very aware when you're making your player pool, you're essentially already constructing your roster for an individual lineup. So when you're doing that, if there's 13 to 15 players in your player pool, I mean, at most four of those guys can be nine K plus and this is a given week, right? A three M is pretty soft pricing this week, but I want this video to be viewed six months from now and it still makes sense. So no more than four of those 13 to 15 guys should be above nine K. And the reason that is, is those guys just start to eat up so much of your salary that if you have six or seven of those guys, one of two things is going to happen. Either a, you're not going to get proper exposure to those guys because you're only using them in two or three of your lineups. And at that point, there's no sense in using them. Or you're trying to cram three of them into one lineup so you get the exposure to them, but now you have no money left over for the bottom end of your roster. You're, you're rostering a bunch of $6,200, $6,300, $6,500 guys, and you don't like how that makes your, your lineup look. So that's why you got to be very aware when you're making your, uh, r your player pool that you usually don't want. On a 15, no, 13 to 15 players, you never want more than four of them above 9K. You want about four to five of them to be in that 7.5 to 8.9 K range. Those are going to be all your average, slightly above, slightly below priced players. And then you want at least five or six to be 7.4 or lower. Cause you really need those guys to make the math of a lineup work. 
Okay. And the more you do it and the more you build your 20 maxes, you'll kind of learn like, oh, I have four of the top five most expensive guys marked for my player pool. That ain't going to work. Because if you have all those guys in there, yeah, you could put them in your lineups, but you're going to end up playing like 20% fee now, but he's 30% owned in the field. Do you really want to play a guy that you're underweight on? That's stupid because no one asked this question, but I'll tell you right now, new guy, fucking welcome to the channel, 2X, whatever someone's projected ownership is. This week, fee now, let's say he's 30%. You better have him in at least 60% of your lineups because if you don't, you just don't have the leverage. If Tony Finau is 30%, you're playing him in 20%, you're just paying the rake. I mean, you technically would do better if he missed the cut because the field is more leveraged on him than you are. So that's fucking stupid. Either shit or get off the pot. Play Tony Finau in 60% or don't play him at all. This is big boy conversation. We're not trying to hedge our bets here. We're trying to win GPPs and that shit's hard and you only do it with really aggressive moves like that. All right, Thomas, that was a long-winded answer. You asked a lot of questions. Long, it was a long-winded answer to a long-winded question. But thanks for asking, brother. All right, next question. David Her David Hernandez wants to know, hey, DGen, love the Discord. Hey, love you, brother. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the rankings on Roto Grinders. I just wanted to know how accurate they are and if they're really a good way to see how good someone is at DFS. Okay, wow, not fucking loaded questions, guys. So let's see. I had this up in anticipation of anticipation of this question even let's go let's go see so if you don't know roto grinders is one of the tout sites out there that you can use their tools build their lineup uh, builder but they're a little bit cooler in one particular thing is they track you can go look and see how players have done all time right so like this is my page that generate tells you what i am who i am on FanDuel, who i am on DraftKings. I'm somehow the number 846 overall player in the world this year when literally in 2022, all I have played is golf. So how the fuck that's the case shows that I made the live final last year, blah, blah, blah. You can go see all my top finishes of all time. You can see I've won a decent amount of GPPs, tons of top fives and big placements and stuff like that. But what's really the coolest is the PGA leaderboard, right? You can see I'm currently ranked 120th. We'll talk about that in a minute, about why that's a little squirrely. But you can go click on it, and you're like, hey, I wonder who the very best PGA uh, DFS players are. And no surprise, it's like Mock Lovin by a fucking mile, Peter Gibbons, Garns. You know, a lot of people you'd expect to see up there. Awesome-o, uh, my dude Jesse is number is up there at number eight. Uh, Kobe, who's going to be on the pod soon, he's at number 11. Uh, you know, a lot of names that if you go through, there's Big T, uh, you know, Slapdick Justin, uh, Bentley he stole two tickets from me this year toe tag and tambo and you can just kind of scroll through here right you get a you can get an idea of who the the top 100 players are these points are assigned by how they actually performed in gpps this year so it's based on these points you get a certain amount of points for finishing and uh and these uh these gpps uh other people that are on here uh let's see uh ba -ba -ba, trying to see if there's some people hey there's john gold jd that, that he's he's a legend he's part of the old uh the old uh, discord and then we've got Alex K. My dude, Alex K is on there. Um, and then you get over here and you'll see uh, what I'm right here at 120, right? For the past four years, I've finished top 100. And honestly, I should be top 100 this year, which leads me to my next point uh, about why Roto Grinders is a little flawed. The problem is, is they forget to put in a lot of results. Uh, just a quick, for instance, I played in the 3180 uh, contest. So you know, it's a $3,200 contest just about six weeks ago. And I finished eighth place, I think which would have been a very nice placing. That would get me a whole bunch of these points, probably somewhere about like five or 600 points. And that would make me easily a top 100 player. Not to mention just two weeks ago in the big $5, the John Deere, I finished 11th overall. That would have probably been another four or 500 points. So the problem with these rankings that you have to consider, there's two. Problem number one is a lot of the results are missing. So like, you know, like if I, if you have my missing results in there, I'd probably be somewhere like around 70. I'm usually somewhere in that 50 to 100 range. This year I'm 120 because they don't have those two results. They don't have my four second places for the uh, fantasy golf world championship tickets that I had this year. So it's missing some results. So like it gives you an idea, but it does, it's not completely accurate. And the other problem with this list is it's very heavily weighted towards heavy buy-ins, right? Notice that like all of my top finishes are the $15, the $10, the 555, 20, 15, 88, 20. You know, I'm really good at taking down massive GPPs and getting really high finishes in those. But the problem is, is some guy who goes in there's a, a $5,000 contest, his 
finishing second in that, even though there's only 10 people weighs just as much as me beating 50,000 people in a GPP, right? So it's very slanted towards heavier buy-ins. That would be my biggest critique, that and the missing results. So to answer your question, yes, it does give you a good idea of who's a good player. If somebody tells you like they're an amazing DFS player and you can't find them in the top 1,000, they're kind of full of shit. And all you got to do is go look at their results. And yes, some of their results may be missing, but even with a lot of mine missing, you can still see I have endless amounts of, of top 10s and stuff in GPP and really big hits um and so do all the other good players uh, shade some of them have an entire page of just wins uh so there you go that's that's roto grinders it's a good way to get a feel for if somebody's talking about it you'd be disappointed to know that a lot of people you get the information from how low they rank on this list thanks for the question david moving right the fuck along uh, this is from Travis Swenson. Hey, DJ, can you describe how you come up with the stats to craft your player pool uh, and the weights behind them? Also, uh, do you uh, use your model strictly from your player pool? Man, great questions there, brother. Well, let's just go. We'll go look at my uh, what I did this week, right? So the first thing I do is I kind of go familiarize myself with the course, look at the whole breakdowns, how many par fours, par threes, par fives there are, what are the distance on those, what are the most common uh, proximity ranges. And by the way, I'm using Fantasy National here. I just ended my membership. Fuck them. I they they're, they're the worst, but I'm used to using it. So this is what I'm going to use to show you. So I look at that first. And then what I do is I just go search the past course. Uh, I go look at the course, how it's played in the past, right? And here's the 2021. I go and I look at strokes gained and I see, oh, you know what was really important here? Well, first of all, around the green was not important. Look how many guys in the top 20 fucking didn't do shit around the greens, right? Putting seems to be really important, but putting is always important. And then off the tee, nobody picked up. Most of the guys in the top 10 did not pick up a lot. So right there, I'm already thinking, man, this is a second shot course. So I'm really going to focus on who's had good approach. And I'm going to look at, you know, guys who putt well, specifically at the 3M. It's on bent grass. So I want to know good bent grass putters. But I keep going and I just go look at the guys who performed well. What were the key stats that led them to doing well? Well, here's a super important one. Good drives gain. That's a, that's a, that was a very important one I put in my model this week, because look, literally everybody in the top 10, except Gary Woodland had good drives gained. And so like that lets me know that you got to stay alive off the tee at this course. You can't get squirrely with the, with the driver, just like Gary Woodland can, or Cam Smith can. And the other one is, and this is no surprise, greens and regulation. So I want guys who are ball striking and are going to put the ball on the green in a green and regulation. If you don't know, that's just like, if it's a par four, they're on and two, that's a green and regulation. And I just keep going through and looking at all these stats. I go, look, hey, par three. Was par three scoring? Ooh, I notice a lot of these guys that did well really seem to not shit the bed on this par three 200 to 225 range. Or I go over here to par fours and I look and I say, oh, man, this 400 to 450 range, only one guy in the top 10 did not pick up strokes there. So maybe that's not where they're getting a lot of birdies, but it's where they're avoiding a lot of bogeys. So that's a stat that I want to consider. I go look at par five. Oh, look at that. Almost everybody except the leader, which is amazing that Cam Champ didn't do well, uh, up there did well on par fives. But it's not just par five scoring. It's specifically par fives 550 to 600, just to narrow it down and get a little bit more precise uh, on that. And then I go do this for all the years that it's been at the scores. Well, you know, not for like 10 years, but like I go look at usually the last four or five years to get a feel. How's the course playing? Was it playing easy? Was it playing hard? Were the greens fast? Bent greens? Who was on the leaderboard? And then I just go through. Now it's a new year. Let's go check out strokes gained. And I go look and I say, oh, there it is again. It's all about approach. Around the green did not mean shit. So at this course, I don't give a shit about around the green. I also go over here and I look, oh, look, around the green, nobody scores. Nobody in the top 10 picks up any shots around the green. They're picking it all up on approach and putting. So now that I have those, I go in there and I factor in things like recent form and course history and stuff like that. And then I just kind of think, which of these stats do I think is the most important? And I start giving those the most weight. And then I make my model and that's how I do it. Uh, that's how I come up with those stats. Uh, you know, I also listen to some content, Andy Lack, of course, talking about the course breakdown. And then, uh, I look at my own stats and I kind of come up with what I think is important to make my stats. Um, and then the second part of your question, how strictly do I follow those stats? I say this all the time. And this is, this pisses off a lot of people because so, this whole industry is built around, Oh, I've got picks and I've got a model. And, uh, and, uh, the real truth is I, maybe 25% of my decision-making comes from my model. I use it to kind of, uh, engage my interest in some guys but as soon as i see one of those guys is shocky get the fuck out of here i ain't gonna play him so to answer your question 
I do consider it and I let it get me on some leans, but I'm not married to anybody. This model says like, who's number one this week on my model, Tony fee. Now he's going to be chalky. Get the fuck out of here. and playing Tony fee. Now coming back from the open championship. What a loser. So, uh, yeah, I, I consider it, but more than anything, what I like to use the model for. And I would say the way that the model has made me the most money is finding some absolute fucking punts. Like who is just somebody down here that nobody's going to play that maybe is just popping in a stat that nobody sees Justin Lauer. He's been playing well. He's really good on bent grass. He's good at those long iron distances. Hmm. And like I use that to maybe find some diamond in the roughs. That 1% guy that is who you need to win that GPP or finish top five in that GPP. So that's what I really use the model for. Thank you for the question, Travis. Moving right along because I, I feel like this is going to go for like two hours if I don't speed it the F up. Forgive all the cussing if you're watching with your family. I'm sorry, family. Could you please uh, see a video on how to form your player pool and actually handcrafting your lineups and balancing exposure using the spreadsheet? How do you think uh, the mixing and matching guys, building a core, balancing, etc.? And then I also got a question from Kim, which I'll also post, which is very, very similar to this. And so I'm just going to answer them both. The first thing I'll do is I'll go over here to my spreadsheet. So this is, uh, you know, this is once you start playing a lot of lineups, you're really going to want to track your exposure. If you're just playing 20 lineups in the $3, it's really easy to track your exposure. It's just basically how many times did you play that guy divided by 20, right? That's your percentage. I played him in five lineups. Okay, you played him in 25%. But I play a myriad of different buy-ins. Uh, I play a lot of three maxes, single entries, stuff like that. And so I have to track them across different dollar amounts. So this was uh, what the, the freaking open championship I did last week. And you can see I did a 555, a 400, three in the 333, two, two or three 200s. That's all those are, right? That's the number of lineups I did and how much that lineup was worth. And so then the first thing I do is I go look at their ownership, which by the way, I put out the best ownership out there, uh, but I only do that for my people over on the discord because it fucking takes forever and it's really hard. Um, and that's probably why most people in the industry suck at it. So I go put in their expected ownership, what I have those guys coming in at. And then what I do is I make sure that I have at least double that exposure for all of my guys. So I had Rory coming in at uh, 19.9. I think he came in more like 23%, but I targeted to have him in 53% of my lineups. Does that mean he's in actually 53% of my lineups? No, that means he's in 53% of the dollars in my lineup. More on that in a second. And I go through. So Morikawa, I only had him projected at 5%. So I only trying to get him in 14% of my lineups, which would still give me almost 3x exposure to him. But then I forgot, you know, Morikawa's a fucking bum and he, and he just quits as soon as nothing, as soon as something doesn't go right. And you can kind of see this is my target ownership that I have for these guys. Always make sure it equals 600 and always take that target percentage times their salary and then multiply them, add all those up and divide by 600. And that number needs to be 833 or less, or your exposures are a bunch of bullshit and it won't add up. Uh, that could be another video all on its own. So the first thing I do is I just start hand making these bad boys. I only did like 40 lineups. Yes. If I'm doing 300, I'll toss them in an optimizer, but I usually play more single entry and three maxes. Cause that's where it's a better investment of your money. And so I look and I say, well, if I want Rory in 53% of my lineups, I better get him in my more expensive lineups, right? Cause as soon as I put Rory in 1% of my line or in one lineup, he's already, I'm already 10% exposed to him because this lineup costs so much more than so many of my others, right? So true exposure is how much that lineup costs versus the total amount you were in. You can see I was in for like 5,300 last week. So as soon as I put him in a 55 or $555 lineup, he's already 10% in my lineups right there, just by putting him in that one lineup, I go down and I say, well, who else am I going to have a lot of? Well, I, if I want 36% Fleetwood better get him in there too. And you're thinking, Oh, that's how you make your lineups. Yeah. Basically is I'm just balancing exposure because trying to get the right six together and being like, Ooh, this will be the one like you're just fucking guessing. If you have a good player pool, you're committed to, to them. It doesn't really matter which lineups they're in. You're still going to have to get lucky on do all six of those guys make the cut do did all six of them perform well and just play this game, pick your six favorite plays every week. And I guarantee you, they'll never be the six best in your player pool. So that's something to consider. One other thing to consider when I'm making these lineups is anybody I have projected at low ownership, Chris Kirk, I had him at 3.1%. I'm getting him in this lineup because in a single entry and a three max ownership gets even more concentrated and you get even more leverage. I have him at 3.1 for like maybe the big $20 uh, millionaire maker. But if you go look at a hundred dollar single entry or a 555 single entry, I bet his ownership is more like 1.5%. Who's somebody else I really like Cam Young. Okay. He came in at like 3%. I had him in my 555 right? And so because 
even though it says 5.8%, that was what I had him projected at in the big milli millionaire maker. But when you get to a single entry, uh, a $500 single entry, ain't nobody playing Cam Young. And so I had him at 2% ownership and he went ham for me. So that is what I'm doing as I'm looking at guys that a, I need to get exposure to because I, I like them more. So I want more exposure to them, but also I want to get the guys that are lowest projected in my ownership so that I have the highest leverage when I'm doing single entry and three maxes. Also give me the Hobbit himself, Brian Harmon and give, oh, I hit the wrong button. Uh, and for my last guy, I don't even know if the math works on this. Just roll with me. Give me old fatty Patty Reed. Okay, there you go. That's my first lineup. And now I have an idea that all of these guys are now 10% owned. And I'm keeping track of how much I'm exposed to that player, what my target goal is, and how much overweight or underweight I am, right? So you can see that I really need to get some Seamus Power in there. I really need to get some more Rory in there because they are the ones that I'm still the furthest behind. So on my next one, I go start Rory and I go start Seamus. And then from there, I'm like, who are some other guys I really need to start getting in the old player pool? Definitely need to get old Webb Simpson in there. He could never miss the cut. Piece of shit. Uh, Corey Connors, right? I just start building like that. And before you know it, these will all start filling up. And uh, you, uh, you, you get an idea of who you need to do. And that's it. So, like, now I'm doing my three 333 lineups. These are still going to weigh a lot because they're very expensive lineups, right? Well, I still haven't done a JT lineup, so I better get a JT in there. Let's go ahead and toss him with Willie Z, Lowry. Go down here. Let's go ahead and get a Tringali. And I'm just looking. I'm trying to mix and match these guys and not just play the same combinations. Uh, and if you're thinking, well, what about ownership, the low-owned guys? Well, first of all, if they're chalky, I generally ain't playing them. Yes, I played Roy this last week uh, and Cam Smith, but that was because they were on the good side of the wave draw, and I would just went all in on that. So they were a little chalkier than I wanted, but at the same time, they literally finished first and second, first and third, first and second. Um, so there you go. That's what I'm doing there, and I just keep doing that for all my lineups. Yes, I'm hand-building all of them. I enjoy the process. I think it's better. The only time I use an optimizer is when I'm doing showdown. I'm just trying to toss 100 lineups in real quick on Saturday night, or if I'm doing 300. I'm going to do 150 in the 5 uh, and 150 in the $20, and so I'll make 300 lineups. Um, but that's really easy to track your exposure on these. This is for when you're playing a multitude of different values, right? And you start with the most expensive ones, and you'll get a pretty good idea of where your ownership is. All right. Thank you for the question, guys. We're moving right along. I uh, hope that answered. Uh, what other stats uh, do you take into consideration with the model ranks uh, when you're making your players? What other stats and data do you take into consideration with model ranks when making your player pool? Well, Russ, uh, the, the most important thing is ownership. That's why like, I make such a big deal about ownership and waiting to the last minute to get the best ownership number you can because, honestly, you could never have known anything about fantasy golf. This is going to, this is going to hurt so many people's feelings because everybody's like, I've got such good picks. No, you don't. No, you really don't. If somebody just played game theory, just jumped in tomorrow, knew nothing about PGA and just simply played pivots every time there was a great play, right? So everybody's playing Finau, you go play who the fuck ever, right? That's like going to be a third of the ownership. And you just did that all the time and nothing else. That would be the single best thing you could ever do to win at PGA DFS. It'll make you uncomfortable. Do you really want to play that guy? Oh, there's a reason nobody's playing Bryson. Oh, there's a reason no one's playing Cam Young. And then they go become the nuts play at the Open Championship, right? If you just play that leverage, it's going to pay off so much. So that is number one. The other thing is uh, weather. I'm a weather whore. Uh, if I see any type of edge for one wave or the other, I will go all in on it. I am not afraid to. So those are the two things I consider uh, Mac, Mac, I wouldn't say I consider them along with my model. I consider them way more than my model. Fuck that model if I think that ownership is going to be pushed one way or the other uh, or, or I think there's great pivots out there or if I see a weather edge. I don't care what my model says. I'll play, I'll play a guy that's dead last in my model if he's going to be 1% and he's on the right wave because it's golf and the shit's variant. And as soon as you understand that and embrace it, you'll enjoy this game so much more. All right, moving on. Uh, asking... Uh, Asking a dumb question. There's no dumb question, Zach. You, sh you send me your mouth down here, sir. I've heard you talking about DraftKings missions uh, done uh, for crowns and just heard John Galt JD talk about them. I know you pay for contests with those crowns, but pretty sure uh, that's not what y'all are gathering them for. Uh, what are you doing when you're collecting the cr crowns? Okay, well, let's go. First of all, uh, where are my crowns at? I had it up here for you. Okay, so you get a mission every day on DraftKings. You know, a lot of people are wondering like, hey, how do you become a... Uh, an onyx member well first of all you got to get a million crowns in a year to get the highest level which is onyx do you really think i'm gambling a million dollars a year on DraftKings? because i'm not 
that would be what twenty thousand dollars a week yeah that's not happening brother um so there's no way the only way you can really get those missions besides literally gambling over twenty thousand dollars a week on DraftKings, is to do these missions so you can see like my mission uh this week that i already have marked they give you they give you missions to do every day one was go play in a 250 fifty dollar contest and you get 2500 bonus crowns not to mention the 250 for the event playing a 300 dollars contest get 3,000 crowns so every day i just go do my mission uh you know i go find a contest that that i like that fits around those missions i go reserve my spot and then wednesday night i make my lineups and i just do that every day and then you end up getting a bang load of crowns in any given week i get probably 20 25,000 crowns both from the amount of money that i put into it uh and all the bonus rewards i get for completing these missions why do you want crowns well first of all <laughs> a million crowns is equivalent to like i don't know two thousand dollars in free lineups but more than that you get that higher status with a higher status you get you know i get like my own vip host any problem i need resolved shit gets taken care of quick i get all kinds of special offers i get invitations to play in that um that summer invitational thing uh you know there are a lot of perks i got free tickets to the pga championship from DraftKings. got to be in their tents got you know free drinks free food free everything so there's a lot of perks it's just it's really no different than a casino right they give you comps based on how much you play if uh something's going to help me get more comps and it's something i'm doing anyways why the fuck not so there you go there's your crowns that's why you play them all right, moving on. Uh, already answered Kim's along with his earlier. As a primary single entry and three max guy, how should I go about throwing these different lineups into all these contests? Do I throw the one I feel most confident in in the higher stakes? Uh, would be cool to see how throwing a certain lineup in a certain contest. Man, what a great question you got there, Mr. Jack W. Um, yeah, I this is something I was wrong on for many years. I would always go make my favorite lineup. And I would go put it in the highest level. Ooh, I'm playing in the $2,000 contest this week. I got to put my favorite lineup in that. But what I really started to realize is my favorite lineup usually was my most pussy lineup. The one where I was kind of not willing to go outside of my comfort zone. Do I, ooh, do I really want to play, you know, CT Pan in a $2,000 lineup? And I used to always kind of play it safe. And then what I realized is playing single entry, especially higher dollar single entry, is the players up there, for lack of a better word, are um, pussies. And they always, I mean, chalk concentrates in those contests, right? So let's say this week, Chris Goderup's going to be the super chalk at 7,900. Everybody's going to play him. He's going to be 20% in the big $20. I guarantee you in the big $3,000 single entry, he will be 35 or 40%. Why? Because like those guys are going to take who they perceive to be the safest, best plays because they're investing a lot of money. And what I found is the best thing to do. And my boy Kobe um, does this too. And this is why he, you know, destroys all the sharks is because like he is not afraid to make those pivots. He will go play a 1% owned guy in a $4,000 lineup. And once I realized you know, after about three years of doing it wrong, I realized that is the way to play it. Now, when I make my single entries and my three maxes, I take the guys from my player pool who I project to be the lowest owned. Like this last week, Dean Burmeester, he was in my player pool, right? I had him projected at 1.9%. A lot of people are like, I'm not playing Dean Burmeester in a $2,000 lineup. But Dean Burmeester would have won you all the money because he fucking smashed. If he's good enough to be in your player pool, he's good enough to be in your most expensive lineup. Once you realize that, then you're free to make the best possible lineups to win single entry and three maxes. If Dean Burmeester's not good enough to be in your most expensive lineup, then he shouldn't be in your fucking player pool. It's that simple. And now that doesn't mean go pick the six lowest guys, right? Because you still want to use your salary. So I'd still play Rory. But then after Rory, instead of playing Fleetwood, maybe I play Decky. Or instead of playing, um, uh, you know, in, instead of playing Seamus Power, I go play Cam Young or something like that, right? Uh, guys that are going to give me the most leverage because in those single entry and three maxes, whatever they are in the regular tournament, the chalk will be even more concentrated and your pivots will be even less owned. Dean Burmeester came in at, what did he come in at? Like 2.9%, right? But I guarantee in the high dollar single entry, legit, he had to be less than 1%. What incredible leverage. So that is the answer to that question. I feel so strongly about this. Play the guys in your pool that make you feel uncomfortable, even in your highest dollar. Because, you know, I know everybody wants to play their six favorite plays, but your six favorite plays, how often is that ever right? I'm going to go ahead and tell you fucking never is the answer, right? And then all you've done is play that your six favorite plays are probably going to be chalkier than the real plays that you should have played. I just punched my mic. That's how fired up I am. Great question, brother. All right make sure i'm not skipping anything uh okay rich carter what is are the one or two things you look for uh it took you a long time to learn uh to heavily to made a heavy difference on your overall winning percentage i get avoiding chalk in contest selection 
but what else? So first of all, the, the biggest thing is, is I just went on like a two minute tirade about it, not being a pussy. Uh, that's the biggest one. When you go play in single entry or higher level contest, be willing. If somebody's good enough to be in your player pool, be willing to put Brandon Wu in your $500 lineup, in your $1,000 lineup, whatever your level is, $200, whatever your big lineup is. If he's in your player pool, you got to be willing to put him in your biggest lineup. Okay. And the reason you do that, as I just said, you're going to get so much more leverage on them. If he's good enough to be in your player pool, he's good enough to be in your highest dollar lineup. So that would be one, not being a pussy. That would probably be the biggest one. And this, the second one would be not playing when I don't see an edge. Yes, my name is the degenerate 75. But if you want, you want to know the real fucking truth about me? I only play when there's an edge. Every Thursday, every Friday, people are like, hey, uh, who are you playing for round one showdown? I'm like, I'm not playing. Like, you're not, I thought you were the showdown guy. Why aren't you playing showdown? Because I don't fucking see an edge. If I see an edge for round one, yes, I will play it. If I see a round, uh, uh, an edge for round two, I will play it. Now, there's always an edge for round three and round four. That's a fucking guarantee. But usually on Thursday and Friday, as the tournament's getting felt out and we still don't have great statistics to go off of, uh, outside of a weather edge, they're just usually not a great edge. It's just guessing. And if I wanted to just guess, I'd go up to 7-Eleven and play a fucking scratch off. So I'm only playing contests where I feel I have an edge. That's also why you'll never see me playing in the 44-44 Millionaire Maker. I can afford to play in that, but it's fucking stupid. Like, half the money goes to first place. What a stupid contest to play in. Unless you're filthy rich and don't care about money. That's not me. Every contest I enter, I say to myself, do I expect to win more on this lineup that I'm putting in? Is it a plus EV move, expected value? And if the answer to that is no, I don't play in it. It's that simple. And yeah, sometimes I'm like, ooh, I love this week. I want to play $10,000 in lineups. But if there's not $10,000 in contests that I see that I have an edge in, fuck it. I'll do however much that there is that I'm comfortable uh, with the advantage in the contest that I have. There you go. Hope that answers your question, Rich. All right, here we go. Run the bases. We talk about using all your salary and showdown slate. Uh, or can we talk about using all of your salary and showdown slates? I completely understand the argument uh, in week long over four courses, but in a single round of high variant golf, it doesn't seem that using all your salary is always the optimal strategy. Uh, so thank you for the gr great question, my run the bases brother. Um, you're exactly right. Everything you said was spot on. In week long, I am a true believer in that you should spend almost all of your salary because you want to get access to the best players and best play better players cost more than less good players. But this is the week of the 3M. I hope you're watching this in the future. I hope it's fucking January right now and you're watching this the week of the Sony Open. But right now, in this current moment in history, the 3M has some of the softest pricing I've ever seen and a bunch of people have withdrawn. So this is actually a week that even a week long, I'm cool with leaving up to probably $1,000 on the table. Normally, I would never say do that because I could get you from somebody like, um, you know, Bobby Mack all the way up to like, I don't know, Jordan Spieth or something like that, right? Like he's obviously a better player. You should do that. But to answer your question about showdown, absolutely. In a single round, especially when there's soft pricing and you want to avoid those, you know, let's say Finau's leading after round three. So Sunday showdown, you know he's going to be 60% and he's going to be 10,400. And you want to fade that chalk heading into that day and all the other high level guys miss the cut, right? So there's just really nowhere to spend your money on. Well, then absolutely. I, in cases like that, I have left upwards of 1,000 to 1,500 on the table because in a single round, it really doesn't, matter near as much okay now uh this last week at the open championship when there were tons of good players and the pricing was pretty tight i was using up almost all my salary maybe leaving 100 on the table but on a week where there's soft pricing a lot of the or or a lot of the high salary guys have missed the cut then yes i'm all for leaving salary on the table at showdown great question dude thank i appreciate you trying to call me out good, good work all right um Nick, the Cajun, uh, in your player pool, do you limit the amount of players from each range? Yeah, I touched on that earlier. Might have been the very first question I did. You'll learn that when you're making a player pool, you're basically, when you're making that pool, you're already making your lineups. And you do that by knowing that how a roster is going to get constructed. If you go make your player pool and you have 15 players in it and six of those guys are above 9,000, you're going to have the shittiest exposures ever. To make that work, you're going to have to have all kinds of guys down in the 6,000s to offset all those expensive guys. So what you'll learn is if I'm doing a 15 player player pool and I want to make 20 lineups out of this and I want to be able to mix and match and you know have all these great combinations. So if my core hits, I make a lot of money you'll learn that basically you don't want to have more than four guys over 9k you don't really want to have more than four to five guys in that 7.5k to 8.9k range and you're going to need at least five or six guys from below 7.4 and lower to really fill those out 
you know, you get it, you start to get a feel, go put a, a 10,700 guy in your lineup and you instantly get a feel for, Oh shit. I'm, you know, it's going to be really hard to get a $9,000 guy in. And if I do, I'm going to be dropping down and putting in three guys below 7.4 K. Right. Uh, just to make the math work. So you start to learn this, the more you make lineups and the more you make player pools. So yes, you have to be very cognizant of each range of salaries whenever you're making that. Good question, my man, Nick. All right, could be Travis. Would you mind uh, to take some time to touch on pricing dynamics? Uh, what should you expect from a golfer over 10K? What What is reasonable for a golfer at 6,500? Uh, are there a few others that I'm not seeing at the prices they are this week and I'm having trouble gambling on who the price? Man, what a great question, Travis. Um, so this is to, to answer your question, this is I hear so many of the big names in the industry talk about this all the time and they're just fucking wrong. Uh, like most things. They always say, oh, that guy's 10,000. If he just gets you a T7, you're golden. Bullshit. Okay. If there's a guy up in 10,000, he gets a T7, right? Let's, for this week, we're using the 3M. Let's just say it's um, Sung JM, right? You're just thinking, man, if Sung JM just gets T7 or worse, I will be, uh, I will be counting the money because I'm going to fade Sung JM because he's a loser. Okay. Or uh, let's even be more dramatic. Let's say T13. He gets T13. You're golden, man. You'll be, because his salary is 10,400. You'll be golden. Bullshit. And let me tell you why. It's because there's this thing called relativity where all success is based on the players that are around them. If every player over 10,000, well, let me check that. Every player over 9,000 misses the cut and Sung JM comes in T13. He is going to be in the optimal lineup because we know one thing. People use their fucking salary. And he is going to be the only guy up there that is. Or let's say just him and Hideki Matsuyama make the cut and Hideki comes in T58 and Sung JM comes in T13. That is a smash play. He is the absolute nuts you have to have this week because we know no one's leaving $7,000 on the table. So we know everybody either had Finau, Deki, or Sung Jay, or a bunch of 9K guys. And if they all miss the cut and it's just Deki and Sung Jay, basically it comes down to who did the best out of that range. So to answer the question, what are your expectations for a guy at 10,500? It's the simplest answer ever. He has to fucking do better than everybody else around him in that range. That's it. That's, that's the most important thing, right? And what is his range? Basically anybody within a thousand of him is what I would say. So if you're do, looking at 10.5 Tony Fee now this week or whatever he is, then I would go all the way down to 9.5. Basically it's like Mav McNeely and all those guys uh, up. And Tony needs to outperform them to justify that salary. If two, three, four of those guys beat him, he becomes a horrible play. Even if he, even if he gets T7, if four of those other guys get more DraftKings points than him and they're at a cheaper price or a relatively equal price to Tony Finau, he's a fucking bust. It's that simple. So now to answer the flip side of that, what should I expect from a $6,500 guy? Oh, this drives me nuts. I want to punch my... Uh, radio every time I hear this radio podcast phone whatever the hell it is well he's 6500 if he just makes the cut you're golden bull fucking shit that is such that is such an idiot take okay first of all have you ever seen somebody win a GPP when they have like a guy finish t65 it doesn't happen they have the winner they have second third and they usually have three other guys in the top 15 that's almost what every winning GPP lineup looks like if they're not all in the top 10 that's like a worst case scenario. You never see somebody with a first, a second, a third, 34th, 45th, and 65th. Those don't win GPPs. Maybe the big like $2,000 entries because you know you don't have to hit the nuts there. But in the big GPPs where you have to hit the nuts, you have no fucking chance of winning a GPP when you have somebody who's T65th. So that whole, all he's got to do is make the cut and you're golden. Yeah, if you're a fucking loser and you're chasing min caches, but if you're trying to win GPPs, the answer is the same for a $6,500 guy as it is for a $10,500 guy. And it's simple. It is relative to the people around him. If everybody down there misses the cut, well, then it, it, all of a sudden making the cut becomes acceptable. But the problem is, is people don't have to put those guys in a lineup to necessarily make it work. People do have to put Tony Finau and Hideki in a lineup to work because people are going to spend their salary. But people don't have to drop down to a $6,500 guy. So not only do you need him to make the cut, you need him to outperform everybody down there and usually get you a top 30 finish. You're just not going to win a big scale GPP without all of your guys in the top 30, even your fucking scrub down at 6,500. So there's your answer. If you think, oh, I'll just play a 6,500. He made the cut. I'm so smart. No, no, that is not good enough. Brandon Wu making the cut last week at the open championship was not good enough. He needed to make the cut and he needed to go get me a T18. He didn't do it. Uh, uh, Dean Burmeister, I needed him to make the cut at 6,700. Not good enough. I needed him to go finish. What did he finish? Like T11? Fucking animal. Dean Burmeister. Did me very well. 
uh, made a big rally on Sunday, largely due to old Dean. Thomas Dietrich, 6,600. Oh, just make the cut. You're good. No, no, I need birdies and I need a, I need a, I need a T13, brother. I don't care that you're 6,600 because there were tons of guys down in the 6,000s that performed very well. And I need you to go perform as well, if not better than all of them. That's what I need from you. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for how that guy does relative to the people around them. And even at 6,500, that might not tell all the case because not everybody's going to be playing those guys in the 6,500s. Everybody will be playing the guys up top. Long winded. And you get me fired up tonight, you mother fathers. All right. Uh, let's see. Weird question from Nick. Uh, well, Nick, technically when you ask a question, they're always weird. Uh, with only three tournaments left, the guy from the FedEx Cup playoffs, do you use motivation as a factor for tiebreakers in your player pool? Uh, have a toss up between two guys. You know, I'm actually, I don't have a strong take on that, Nick, but I would say this. I would say if you think he's more motivated, I could make the counter argument that he feels even more pressure. And, you know, we've already seen what pressure does to guys on Sundays. How do you know it's not doing the same thing to that guy Friday afternoon when he's working to make the cut so he can try to keep his card or make the FedEx uh, Cup playoffs or whatever, right? So I would say that it's just not for me, right? Because I, I could make the argument that the pressure that they feel outweighs any added motivation they may have right so i i don't love it i don't i would i would not that's that's my answer all right ramon jackson there are several amateurs that made the cut at the open what are some sources that you can use to look at these guys before majors well first of all let me just tell you don't get caught up in that man amateurs making the cut they just don't have the upside to ever really win you a gpp and you basically are just playing the lottery when you're counting on an amateur coming through but if you insist on being one of those guys that tries to outsmart everybody let me say this. Those amateurs probably cost 6,300, right? You can go, you could have got Brandon Wu at 6,100 or, or Dietrich at 66 or Burmeester. And those are real life professional golfers who have shown a propensity to be successful. Why? And, and they're all one or 2% also. So why not go play these guys at one or 2% versus playing some scrub amateur that you're just completely rolling the dice on at 0.5%. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. So I would rather just play professionals like a Lucas Glover. Yes, Lucas Glover sucks, but he's still better than every amateur out there. But if you're insistent upon it, go check out uh, the official Golf World rankings. Everybody's on there. Just search their names uh, and go look them up and see where they've played and what their results are. That would be my answer. All right. Hey, I think we are on to the last question from Andy. Uh, provide a comment on uh, bankroll and contest selection. Example, if you've got $1,000 to $1,500 to play, would you suggest playing in the 777 single entry and two uh, uh, 333s, the 5 max? Or use a variation of a bunch of one hundred and two hundred dollars and the one fifty three max. Um, Andy, fucking legendary question, bro. I got this up. This is this week. Once again, we're at the three m. I hope you. Hey, new guy. Thank you for fucking watching this long. I appreciate it. Go drop a like. Maybe a subscribe. And if you think if you think I tell the truth, you know, don't forget about the Patreon. Uh, over two hundred members in nine days. Not too fucking bad. So. To answer your question, there is two ways to go about this, Andy. The first thing is is make your player pool. But go, go, go star all the guys you like. Did you like 12 guys this week? Did you like 18 guys this week? 24, 30, you know, this week, I don't exactly love a lot of guys. All the guys I did like are fucking chalk. So I'm kind of thinking, man, with all this chalk out there, do I really want to play those guys? And I think the answer is going to be no, I don't want to play chalk. And if there's a wind advantage, half the guys I like, they're out the door too. Okay. So this week is probably a great week for me to have a smaller player pool. 10 or 12 guys maybe look at doing somewhere between like six and eight lineups and just rotating those guys and just hoping I smash the nuts this week, right? So that's one thing to consider. How many guys do you like could help answer that, right? If you like more guys, well, then play in more of the $100 and the $200 and don't go blow it all on three lineups, right? Maybe blow it on 10 or 15 lineups so you can have more exposure to more guys. The other thing to consider is the contest themselves, so like, um, you know, this 333 right here, let's look at it. It's just the best. There's only 500 people in it. It's a five max. So no one, no, all the big guys aren't entering 150 on us or 30 or whatever the number. And it's got a super flat payout structure, which is super nice. If you, even if you get, you know, like third place, you're going to be super happy. It is a very good payday. So that's something to consider. But then you also go look and you look at the $200 and yes, it's fucking, it's great too. And so what I really start to do to break these ties is I look, is there any that like just really suck? The 555, um, you know, it's not as good as the other two because you can see first place is 100,000, but then you drop down to 10th, you only get 4,000. That's only 125th of what first place is. I like it to be closer to 110th. So other things you can look at is just how good the contest is. Let's go check out that 777. Uh, 
let's see. So there's only 35 people in it, which you got to love that. First place is $7,000. So you got to ask yourself, is that worth the investment? If you actually do hit a good lineup and you win that thing, you're not, you only get nine extra money. No, I'll be the first to acknowledge you only got to beat 35 people. And that is a nice flat payout structure. Um, so it basically comes down to how good are the contests. And for whatever reason, DraftKings put out some fucking beautiful contests this week. So I can't even, I'm really trying to find one to go shit on for you here. Like a, a lineup to go shit on. Maybe, maybe uh, I just saw the 150. Where'd you go? Yeah, here's the 150 you're talking about. You know, you look at this and this, once again, a very solid payout structure, right? 10th place pays 500 first is 7,500. That is not bad. But maybe you're thinking, man, I want more upside than 7,500 bucks. If I'm going to put in $2,000 this week, I at least want a chance to win 30,000, 25,000, whatever your number is, right? And if you're playing in these smaller contests like this, you don't have that upside. So that's something to consider also is what do you want your upside to be? You know, maybe $7,500 is good enough for you. And they, let's, let's face it, that's a good payday too, right? But, you know, for me, I'm looking to get as many $25,000 cashes a year as I can. And so basically that ends up becoming a cutoff for me. I want first place to at least be 25,000 so that I have a chance to get it. So in my case, if I were doing what you were doing, I would be looking hard at this 333 because I love that it's a five max. I love first place. I love the flat payout structure. Uh, I, that the 777, that's a lot for me to enter when I could just go enter all these 200 and 100s because they usually do three 200s and two $100 single entries, which I love. And 20,000 up first. Yeah, that's not quite 25, but it's pretty damn good, bro. Um, here's the bigger one. And then 50,000 up first, 25 to second. Like I would rather play in those but it's kind of your comfort zone. These are a lot more volatility. And that 777 and the 3 Max 150, yes, it's a lot less up top, but they're also very, very winnable. This one, you're lucky if you win something like this, you know, once every two years. So that's my answer. All right, guys, that was a lot. I hope you enjoyed all this. If you don't know, I made a pod. I have a podcast called The Degenerate 75 Talks Golf with Smart People, and I just put out my first episode. You should go check it out. It fucking got like three or 400 downloads, which is crazy because I'm not a podcast guy. I had Andy Lack on. It's amazing. I got more guests coming. Go subscribe to that. Hey, leave me a five-star review on uh, Apple Podcasts, and I'll put your name on this big-ass will. And tomorrow night, Wednesday night, I do a stream, and I draw names off of this. And if you get drawn, you get to make a lineup with me that we're going to put in the big contest and we split the winnings 50 50 and i think first place this week's 250k so that would be pretty cool if we could split like you know 125k a piece right so uh all you got to do is go leave me a five-star review say some nice words about the pod and you get three names on here uh i hope you're just finding my channel go like and sub and follow me on twitter degenerate 75 you mother father uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope some of you are new. For all my Patreon people, thank you for the continued support. I am not going to stop. I'll just keep going. Uh, I think that's it. We'll see you guys tomorrow for the live stream. We're back to 7 o'clock. Can't wait to see you, mother fathers. Later, guys.